Well, good morning, church family. I hope you're all doing well this morning, and, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity and, and the privilege to be able to open up the Word and, and expound upon a passage that offers critical insight into the grand narrative of God's plan for salvation and redemption. For those of you who are just checking out the faith or just here because uh, someone drug you along, I just want to welcome you this morning. We're so glad that you're here, uh, and we just hope that this service is a blessing to you. This morning's message is entitled, An Acquaintance with Agony. An Acquaintance with Agony. I want to invite you this morning to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. If you aren't sure where to find the Gospel of Matthew, open up your Bibles about halfway, if you, and you'll be close. If you land in Mark, Luke, John, you've gone a little bit too far. If you're in a name that you can't really pronounce, go a little bit further and you'll find it. So... We'll start in verse 36 this morning, and uh, while you're turning there and some of your cases scrolling there, um, I just want you to, to sit and wrestle with a time where you felt uh, agony or where you felt a, a period of distress. Um, I really want us to reflect on this time because I know for most of you, reflecting on a time where we've been grieved or hurt isn't pleasant, but I want to remind you here this morning that we have a God that's all too familiar with suffering. He's all too familiar with our pain. And so I just want us to, um, to reflect on these circumstances. And I know that images of loss, maybe despair, come to mind. Uh, lost hopes, lost dreams. And so I want to let you know that the agony that you've gone through, you haven't gone through it alone. And so I want you to know that those of you who are suffering, who are struggling this morning, that I grieve with you, that we as a church family grieve with you that our Lord ultimately grieves with you. And so what I want us to do this morning is is recognize where our peace comes from. And in the midst of our grief, help us to remember that we serve a risen king who is all too familiar with suffering. He's all too familiar with sorrow. And he's all too familiar with loneliness. So our, our Savior can sympathize with you. Our passage reveals that he entered into suffering. He didn't flee from it. He doesn't flee from it, and he's with us in our darkest hours. And so I'd ask you this morning, if you could just please stand in honor of God's word, and and we'll read Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46. I'll read and just please follow along. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. This morning, we come to a very familiar account of our Lord's agony and suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus wrestles with the reality of the cross. Before we dive into our passage, I want to provide a 30,000-foot perspective of the Gospel of Matthew, which will allow us to land in this text uh, so we can better understand this particular account. So the Gospel of Matthew was written predominantly to a Jewish audience for the purpose of clearly and accurately presenting and explaining Jesus' true identity. And we have to remember that as we go about this passage. What is Jesus' identity in this scene? Matthew's primary concern in the entirety of the gospel is to reveal Jesus Christ as Savior, as the coming King, as the promised Messiah. 
And Matthew's focus and purpose was to integrate his own personal Christology to portray the fullness, the vastness, and the deity of Christ. And so the book can be broken down into three major sections, and we can, we can really hone into where we are this morning. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 through 4.16 really focuses on the person of Jesus, his infancy, his development, his growth. Matthew 4.17 through 16 through 1620, uh, really highlight the proclamation of Jesus, Messiah. And Matthew 1621 through 2820, really highlight the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, Messiah. And so this morning we find ourselves in this act of Matthew's gospel account, specifically the section relating to the suffering of our Lord Jesus. And so for Jesus, The Garden of Gethsemane was the moment where he faced the inevitability of the cross. The entirety of his life was lived under the shadow of the cross. And the Garden of Gethsemane was the climax of this knowledge. This awareness meant that Jesus knew of every detail that was set before him. And all that was going to happen in the coming hours. Where Jesus would later be betrayed, sentenced to death, and crucified. Apart from the cross, we must remember that no greater agony has ever been experienced by anyone. No man has ever suffered like our Lord Jesus. And so this, this is the night when, when Jesus anticipates drinking the cup of divine wrath, which will be his in full at the cross. And this morning, I want us to stop and slow down and marvel at our Christ. I want us to take some time and really understand that all that happens in these precious verses. And in order to do so, we're going to look at just three basic points. We're going to look at the sorrow of our Savior. We're going to look at the submission of our Savior. And we're going to look at the strength of our Savior. But prior to, it's important to understand some of the context regarding the garden scene. And so Jesus and his disciples in the previous verses, it describes they have just observed the Passover feast. They have instituted the Lord's Supper, and Peter's denial has been predicted. This event that we're going to be looking at is literally taking place just moments after that. They had left the upper room except for Judas, who had left early on. Now Jesus and his remaining disciples are on the way to the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. We must not miss in this moment the climactic intensity of what is happening in the text. It is in the garden where Jesus experienced his last moments before his arrest and crucifixion. And I think we can learn from Jesus because last words are often lasting words and last moments are often lasting moments. And so he is hours, mere hours away from swallowing the cup of divine wrath that would be unleashed upon him. So Jesus was undoubtedly a man of sorrows. So we'll pick up the the story in verse 36 and read through verse 39. It says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here. While I go over there and pray, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. The Mount of Olives is roughly 300 feet above the city of Jerusalem, and on the western slope is a, is a garden, and uh, just across the Kidron Valley, and this garden is filled with beautiful shrubs, ground cover, and ancient olive trees, and Jesus and the disciples enter into Gethsemane, which, a place that, which was a place that Jesus often went to pray, spend time with his disciples, and ultimately seek his Father in prayer. Gethsemane, literally translated olive press or oil press, is profoundly symbolic. The olive press originally used in Gethsemane would have pressed the olives with enough force that it would release a reddish fluid from its pulp. A beam would be packed with enough weight that it would press the oil out of the olive. Similarly, the sorrow for what's coming now begins to press upon Jesus. And when Jesus arrives at Gethsemane, He leaves the majority of his disciples along the outer edge, and he takes along Peter and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he takes them further into the depths. And he takes this trinity of disciples, and these these three men, uh, they they would have been his closest companions. 
These men would have been the one who would have witnessed Jesus' greatest exaltation on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Now these men will be the witness of Jesus' greatest humiliation in the garden. And simply put, Jesus brought along these disciples for companionship. And I know the question can come up, is that, does God really need them? If Jesus is fully God, why would he need a human companion? Why would he need these men? Does it show that he lacked something? And I don't think so. I think it's because Jesus was fully God and fully man. He had a distinct and marvelous humanity to him that, that would never contradict his own deity. And so I think for us, we can relate to this because there's times where we go through sorrow and distress. And isn't it a gift from the Lord that, that there are people who will be praying, who will be petitioning, who will be loving and caring for us? And that's exactly why Jesus asked them to come. He simply wants them to be praying, to watch out for him, and to provide companionship. So we'll continue in verse 37. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. The sorrow that Jesus experienced had resulted from his anticipation of the spiritual suffering that was to come, not the physical. It was a deep anguish and distress, so deep that it nearly killed him. He knew what was coming. Jesus had lived a perfect life, he had never sinned, not even once. But Jesus in this moment is coming to the realization that he was literally about to become sin in the very sight of God. He was going to experience the death that all sinners deserve, the death that I deserve, the death that you deserve. And that death is complete separation from God and God's wrath ultimately poured out. And so Jesus, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, was literally going to become sin in the eyes of his father. And so what does that mean? And I think we can find clues when we read 2 Corinthians 5.21, where it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What a marvelous truth that is. And Jesus' death, like I said, was not what was causing him to be sorrowful. He came to this earth and was mission-oriented. He knew that he had to come to save man from their sins. And so to die was not the problem. The problem was the kind of death that he would have to experience. Although Jesus was omniscient, he had become aware of an experience that was to come, and it was an experience that he never had had before. He was truly amazed, and I think the word amazing um, is, a, is a unique word. And if you look in the parallel accounts in Mark and Luke, the intensity of the struggle uh, genuinely caused Jesus to be amazed in this moment because he had never experienced what this moment would be like. And so the intensity of the struggle for every sinner, he took that sinner's eternal wrath upon himself. So Jesus in this moment, was only hours away from becoming completely separated from the Father, who he had experienced perfect intimacy with for his entire life. This is the genuine source of anguish. More than the humiliation, more than the crown of thorns, more than the mocking, the flogging, the nails through his wrists and feet, more than the spear in his side, and any more than any of the agonizing physical torture, the anguish was stemming from the fact that Jesus didn't want to be separated or forsaken from the perfect intimacy he had always known. Verse 39, going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Imagine knowing what we know about Jesus. We have our, our Bibles in front of us, and we can look back, and that's always great. But imagine what we know about the power and strength of Jesus and how we would have interpreted seeing him on the ground. Jesus, the one exalted above the heavens, was now crawling upon the ground and cries, My Father, as if he were a young boy craw crying out to his dad for help. And the act of falling on one's face in this position was used to describe men like Abraham 
and Moses, who fell on their face in the visible presence of God. And we see that in Genesis 17, verse 3, Numbers 16, verse 4. And his posture there in that moment revealed full surrender. It revealed a sense of willingness. It it resembled his humility to submit his own will before the Father. And no one in the history of the world would pray with such agony. And there's nothing even in the book of Psalms of lament that compared to the kind of agony that Jesus will experience because no one could endure what Jesus had experienced. So Jesus petitions to the Father, if it is possible, and this is a request to see if if the mission can be fulfilled in any other way besides the separation. And what are the Father's what is the Father answer to Jesus' prayer? Well, I think there's two possibilities. I think the first option could be, he answers, yes, there are other ways for me to accomplish my purpose in providing salvation for my people, in which case the upcoming death and suffering of Christ on the cross would be outside of God's control and unnecessary to complete God's will. Option two, he silently answers, no, there is no other way for sinners to be saved than by means of atonement. You must suffer and die in their place because the wages of sin is death. And someone must bear the penalty. And I believe that this last possibility is the way that the father answered his son's prayer. The immediate proclamation by Jesus indicates that he is going to fully surrender to do what the father's will is, no matter the cost. He is laying down his life as a willing savior, not out of the manipulation of the father. He drank the cup of God's wrath so that you and I might be able to drink the cup of God's grace. In these agonizing moments, Jesus is laying face down in the garden, pleading with his father. He's aware that all of his disciples will soon abandon him, that his own father, who he had shared in perfect intimacy with, would abandon him as well. He would turn his back on him, and further, furthermore, Jesus would face the wrath of his father against sin, poured out like a laser directly upon himself as he drinks the cup that he has been given. And this is genuinely the horrible, beautiful picture of suffering. The reality of this realization is that it should have been you and me who have endured this type of punishment. The cup should have been in my hand, and the cup should have been in your hand. It should have been us on the cross. But he took the cup upon himself. He lived the life that we could never live. He died the death that we deserve. And he flipped the cup over and said, it is finished. And that is our Savior this morning. So I rejoice in the fact that there are those who have put their faith in Christ and you guys can stand firm that you will never have to experience what separation from God feels like. Jesus' death was a substitutionary atonement for your sin and you can remain confident in your salvation. Nevertheless, I carry a burden that there are people in this sanctuary, that there are people across our communities, that there are people across the nations and on the other side of this world who have not heard the name of Jesus. There are people who have not made Jesus the Lord of their life. And because of this, you could still suffer the agonizing pain of being separated from God for eternity in hell. And for believers here today, I urge you to pray for those who do not yet know Christ. It's the greatest thing that we can do is be praying for our brothers and sisters. Petition and plead with the Lord that they may come to know his saving grace. And I know there's always the question that comes up of how could a loving God punish his own son or send people to hell? That's not a God that I want to associate with. And I think there's a lot of misinterpretations with this question because fundamentally, our idea of wrath is completely different from God's. We are all sinners and we have all fallen short. Yet God is perfect and God is holy. Therefore, sin does not have the ability to enter into his presence. And the wrath of God is not careless, it's not morally corrupt. Rather, it's an honest and necessary reaction of objective moral evil in this world. And it's precisely because God is holy and just that he does this towards anything that is the opposite, which is sin. And simply put, to define sin, I feel that sin is anything that violates God's commands, that distorts his glory. John Piper says it perfectly, 
Every sin that flows from the failure to treasure the glory of God above all things. And God is madly in love with his glory. And many are not okay with that. If we read Isaiah 42, 8, the text says, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Allowing sin in his presence would destroy his very deity and his identity. Jesus is agonizing on our behalf and will ultimately destroy the penalty of sin and death for all time by becoming the sacrifice for us. And Jesus is the Savior, and that's exactly what Matthew is trying to present in his gospel. If anything that we can leave with is an understanding that Jesus came to save us from our sin, to save us from the destruction, to save us from the shackles that sin so binds around us, and it affects our very life. That is why Jesus surrendered to the Father's will, as it says, yet not as I will, but as you will. And so the garden scene, the Garden of Gethsemane, provides a stark contrast to the Garden of Eden. Eden was the garden where man, the first Adam, would fall by giving in to temptation. Here man would say, not your will, God, but mine. And Gethsemane was the garden where the second and greater Adam stands by faith in God and reigned victorious by yielding completely to the will of God. The Garden of Eden meant death. Yet the Garden of Gethsemane means hope because Jesus Christ obeyed the Father perfectly. He was resolved triumphantly. He was resolved majestically. He was resolved unhesitatingly to do what the Father had asked him to do. And he's going to the cross. So I want to pose a question this morning just to kind of sit and wrestle with. And so the question that I have is, is what are the ways in which you are hesitant to do what the Father has asked you to do? In other words, where are you refusing to surrender to the Lord's will in your life? Where do we say, God, I will give you this, but not that? God, I'm too broken to give up this sin to you. God, not as you will, but as I will. Ponder what those things are and pray earnestly that God would, in his grace, allow you to put his will above your own. And it's important that we remember that we can't barter with God in these moments. He doesn't want just a portion of us. He wants all of us. He wants all of our heart. And God desires that we would love him with all that we are in every part of our being. And to those of you who are exploring the faith or new to what, it's, what it means to be a follower of Christ, I want you to know that God is deeply in love with you. He is patient. He is just. He is trustworthy. He wants you to come home and experience freedom today. And this is evidence in Jesus' unwavering commitment to bear your sins. And to those of you who have repented of your sins and put your faith in the Lord, I want you to consider for that which is competing for God's glory in your life. God wants and he deserves all of the glory. And this is a glory that he's not willing to share. I want you to consider the things that compete for his glory in your life. Is it the friendships you have, your career, financial pursuits, popularity, your image on social media, worries that you have, fear, anxiety, pride, or even the most secret of sin? Do any of these things consume you? We find hope in Galatians 5.1 where it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. What this verse is saying that, that we aren't to go back to our old sinful lifestyle, that we should not ta- recognize that the shackles have been taken off and go and put them back on ourselves. We should stand and rejoice and pro- proclaim Christ in the freedom that he has offered to us. So the power of Christ in you is more than enough to conquer that which you are facing. When you are saved, you are free of guilt. You are free of condemnation. You are the free of the toxic shame that is so prevalent in our lives because Jesus made a way. The chains have been broken, and when we recognize the way, we submit to the way, and we find life in the way. And that's exactly how God's glory is seen in our lives. 
One of the things that, that I think this passage reveals to us is the fact that we struggle with sin so much because the power of evil is so strong in our nature. We struggle to do what is right and to grasp righteousness. Our battle is to fight against the compelling impulses of evil within us. But that's not the case with Jesus. Jesus struggled because the power of holiness was the only thing in him, and he had to grapple with our sinfulness. It's in these quiet moments of the garden that Jesus looks and sees hell with all its terror, yet he still chooses to honor the Father. And Jesus' submission to the Father is the epitome of man submitting completely and eternally to the divine will of God. Jesus, the teacher of the model prayer in Matthew 6, is now providing a perfect illustration of what he had taught early on. The blameless Son of God was practicing what he preached, illustrating the importance of praying that the Father's will would be done. And this is the resounding purpose and desired result of Gethsemane. So now we'll look at the submission of our Savior as the account continues. Verse 40. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Returning from his first petition, Jesus is indignant to find the disciples asleep during his most painful evening. When Jesus desired fellowship, there was none to be found. We can reference this in Psalm 69, verse 20. Verse 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's what he said to them. But that's not all he said. The petition would be reminiscent of Matthew 6, where Jesus first taught his disciples how to pray. And part of the Lord's prayer is that that we ought to pray that the Father would lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus was admonishing his disciples to be victorious at fighting temptation through the means of prayer, something we can all accept as teaching for our own lives. The disciples should have been praying in these moments, but they were ignorant to the very danger they were in. The enemy was already at work in Judas and would later work in the hearts of these men to tempt them to abandon Jesus. You see, Jesus' admonition to the disciples not to fall into temptation is important for us to understand today. Because just hours before, all his disciples were with him. They promised they would never abandon him. They were confident that no matter what, no matter what trials they would go through, They would never denounce their Christ. But Jesus knew them, and he knew their hearts. He knew the enemy, and he knew the disciples would abandon him. But he offers a warning to stand firm, to remain rooted in the faith. And the disciples, although would ultimately fail, we can learn from their failure this morning. We can go through our lives most days with a posture that says, Yes, Lord, I love you. You are all that I need. I desire to follow you and be obedient and trust you in all that I do. I think this is our good times posture. But the goal of the enemy is to rid us of our strength. It's a strength that he acknowledges comes from the Lord, our source. And ultimately, the enemy desires that we shift from a God-centered posture to a me-centered posture of self-reliance. Our self-reliance forces us to forget the promise maker and the promise keeper. This typically happens when we face trials and temptations. And when we do this, the enemy ultimately gets his way. But God, by his very word in our day and age, can speak to us in a moment of temptation and strengthen us before, before we actually give in. But what I find most comforting in this verse is the fact that Jesus is going through one of his darkest moments of agony. Yet he steps back, goes to his disciples, and offers them a warning. He's compassionate with them. He comforts them. He was still looking out for them, and he's still looking out for us today. And the spirit mentioned in the second part of verse 41 is our human spirit, not the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's our own willpower to handle situations. Jesus recognized that the disciples could not rely upon their own strength and still remain faithful to him. And this is the same for us. We need to be strengthened by the Lord through prayer, 
in order to combat our temptation. This is a word of warning to us. We have an enemy. Our flesh is weak. And we must take heed lest we fall. We must live in constant reliance upon God for our faithful, for faithfulness. And Satan in these moments was heavily at work not only to tempt the disciples, but, but to tempt Jesus from, from not drinking the cup and bearing the cross. Satan's goal in the garden was to tempt Jesus out of this acceptance, out of this reality. To say it's too much, it's too hard. And if Satan were to succeed in these moments, and we really think about that, then hell would be the only eternal residence for humanity. The promise of salvation in these moments could have been made a lie. Think about that. Verse 42, he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. A parallel account in Luke 22, verse 43 and 44, indicates that an angel is sent to strengthen the Lord in these moments. Something that he created is now having to come and sustain him. And it says this, An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. The anguish experienced is said to have caused the capillaries just below the surface of the head to burst, causing Jesus in these moments to physically sweat drops of blood. It was an excruciating moment, and the shedding of of the blood from our precious Lamb of God doesn't just begin at Calvary, rather it begins through desperation in Gethsemane. The weaker Jesus got, the more earnest his prayers become, and he prayed in a humble state. He had no pride during his prayers. One may ask, well, what does pride have to do with Jesus' prayer? And I think that pride is the barrier that can prevent us from receiving God's strength in our own time of weakness. God is gracious to the humble and he opposes the proud. And and I think that during our weakness, we tend to rely upon our own strength. We testify, God, I can do it. I don't really need you. We look to our own ways. I can work harder. I can get through this. I can get by. My sin really isn't that bad. It's not hurting anyone. This pride will prevent us from reaping the grace that is offered through Christ. We cannot rely upon our own strength. We have to call upon the one whom through all things are possible. We must be willing to humble ourselves enough for Christ to bless our situation. And I'll repeat that. We must be willing to humble ourselves enough for Christ to bless our situation. Jesus, in these moments, his heart is heavy, it's full of anguish, and in his three petitions, there's not much variety. But even the master of language, he prayed a third time saying the same words. And so, we'll continue in verse 45 to to look at the strength of our Savior. Verse 45, then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Through the sorrow and submission of Jesus, we're left to marvel at his strength, his power, his majesty. And Jesus' obedience to the Father reveals a profound depth of love. And the primary fact that Jesus entered into the garden in the first place was a bold statement that Jesus was willing to go to the cross. Because Jesus knew that Judas knew that he would go there. This was a place where Jesus would go nearly every night. And so the act of going into the garden was not an attempt to hide. It was not an attempt to flee. It was an attempt to take what he needed to do. Rather, Jesus recognized that he had the power to lay down his own life, and he has the power to take it up again. And so through Christ, we have victory. There's no greater courage than that which Jesus exhibits as he calls his disciples up off the ground and makes his way to the cross. The hour that Jesus refers to in verse 45 is is the moment in which Christ's death was imminent, before there was still a plausibility that he could back out. But the hour refers to he is fully aware, he is fully committed, there is no going back. He is going to the cross. In the hands of sinners that Jesus speaks of are the men who rebelled against God. They were the ones who rejected Jesus and his identity. These were the Pharisees, 
the religious leaders and even those who had turned their back on him. It was not just these people, though, at a particular time. The hands of sinners are the hands of all sinners. It's you and me. The hands of sinners mocked, scorned, beat, and tortured the Son of God as he was saving us. And God took every ounce of our sin upon himself while on the cross as he was offering us our greatest gift of grace. And such a marvelous truth in this passage is that Christ can redeem our most destitute of situations. That when we feel like we're hopeless, Christ extends grace. But how could Christ ever redeem the hands of sinners? Well, this morning, we can use those hands and these same hands of sinners in worship to the Lord. We can lift our hands in praise and adoration and proclaim that we are deeply in love with our Savior. The blood of Christ has redeemed our unclean hands. And Jesus' purpose was to save a lost and dying world, and we can receive the love of Christ that was pressed out in the garden if we are willing to allow Jesus to take the cup on our behalf. Like Jesus, our our peace is found in honest, passionate, and persistent prayer. Prayer that allows us to overcome the weakness of our own flesh and to be strengthened by the power of the Spirit. And thankfully, we can rest assured that we will never have to bear what Jesus bore, but we do have to come to the Father and accept what was done on our behalf. Gethsemane, Gethsemane was a place of suffering and strength. Jesus' sorrows were removed as he was strengthened through fervent and persistent prayer. Through the example of Christ, we can begin to understand the proper, will, proper role of the will in the human life. This passage should open up our hearts to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice on the cross. We are to hate sin, love God, and erupt in thunderous praise as we worship him with our very lives. Lives that he freely gave to us that we can only do but return to him. We must recognize that there's more mercy in Christ than sin in us. The victory over sin was really won in Gethsemane but was paid for in Calvary. Our Lord Jesus can identify with our suffering. When we feel abandoned or hopeless, when we lose that job, when when a close family member is no longer with us, when a marriage fails, when, when we lose a child, we can rest that that Jesus is with us. Our Lord can identify with us in our suffering. He is the man of sorrows and was acquainted with grief. In the garden, Jesus cries out to the Father, Abba, Father. We can't be afraid to do the same. There's power when we spend time in the Father's presence. So I encourage you to make time for that. Spend time in passionate and persistent prayer. Spend time with the Father. He desires it, and he knows it's in your best interest. God doesn't always remove the suffering of our lives, but he will give you strength in the midst of it. We see with Christ where he recognized in his pleading prayers that as he would humble himself, he could be more earnestly filled. And that filling provided the necessary strength to go to the cross. So the end of the story provides us with hope because Christ's suffering gave way to glory. He was crucified, but he didn't remain there. It was our Lord's trust in the Father that allowed for sin to be defeated. And this paved a way so that you and I could regain fellowship with him. Because without it, we couldn't. And so this morning, I urge you to consider the sorrow. Consider the submission. Consider the strength of Christ. He wants you to reach out and accept his mercy and grace. He is in love with you. And he came to bear your sin. And he says on the cross, it is finished. I have made a way. Father, we thank you for your word. We are thankful to be your people just for this time of fellowship. We come to you as beggars this morning in need of your grace and mercy. And you sacrifice so that we may have life. As we ponder the garden this morning and prepare to take the elements, I pray that you would increase our gratitude for Jesus and all that he has done on our behalf. For doing what we could never do ourselves. And you are the Savior 
worthy of all praise. I pray that in our trials we will remember that we have a relatable, sympathetic high priest who is with us and able to supply grace and strength. Let us be in your presence to endure and trust in our trials. We long for the day where we will see Christ and share in that glorious intimacy. Grant us grace in this day and forevermore. Grant us fellowship this morning. Lord, help us to live lives that are worthy of the calling, worthy of your sacrifice. Lord, help us to just fall on our knees and and reach out to you this morning for mercy, begging you, and you know that we need you. And so we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.